Welcome back to another video. Today we are joined by my client Charles. And uh, as opposed to going through like a, a classic, horrible, false testimonial based kind of video, Charles and I decided to hop on a Zoom call and explore the whole process of him starting out his online fitness coaching business, his experiences beforehand, his working in a nine to five job in a recruitment business, the loss of his mom, everything. We explored his whole story up to the point where last month he collected $14,600 with his business, which is very impressive. So yeah, we start off the journey with where Charles started working recruitment and I uh, really, really hated that job to the extent where actually he asked his mum to pay for his first course to learn how to build his online fitness coaching business from a previous mentor and she paid for that product, which is awesome. Really, really cool of her. He then actually got fired from his job in recruitment whilst trying to build his online fitness coaching business because he's working one hour per day uh, on his actual job is nine to five, which is being paid for whilst he's building his business. So he talks about that in detail, which is really cool. Um, unfortunately, about a year ago, he lost his mother. So he talks about how he's dealt with grief whilst also building his business and managing other relationships with family members, his girlfriend, clients, etc. So that's a really interesting part of the conversation. Obviously, last month, he scaled his business to $14,600. So we took a look at the components which contributed to that. Uh, furthering this, we then explored Charles' desire for freedom as opposed to huge financial growth and success. So I found that component of the call really interesting. Charles's desire when enrolling in this program wasn't necessarily to grow to the highest extent he possibly could have done financially speaking. It was more so to ensure he had uh, financial stability or at least financial growth to the extent where he could then live a life of total freedom. So he could travel, he could bring his girlfriend with him, his girlfriend could work with him in his business, he can move around the world. That's subjective. He, he much rather prefers to work five, six hours per day and earn, you know, 15, 20K per month for his business and live a life of freedom as opposed to scaling towards 50 to 100K per month. So I thought that was a very interesting take and it's something which I think you guys will appreciate in terms of having a different perspective because my perspective of business is to scale to as high a height as possible. You know, ultimately my objective is to, to get to the billion level of entrepreneurship, but Charles just has a very different opinion, a very different take. So I thought it was really interesting. Uh, and finally, we then take a look at why Charles decided to bring on his girlfriend to his business and how they manage working together. Hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you have done, please make sure you hit the subscribe button. Leave us a, a thumbs up, of course, and let us know what you'd like to see in future pieces of content in the comments section down below. I'll leave you guys to it. First and foremost, give me a little bit of context. Talk me through a little bit about your childhood, how things started out maybe perhaps your experience with education also in terms of uh, <laughs> your whether or not you enjoyed school and then what happened from there. Talk me through it. It's a very good question. Like, I mean, my, my start was a bit, little bit rough. I'm born almost two months too early with, with a club foot. So to this day, my left foot is almost, I mean, almost eight shoe numbers shorter than the right foot. So my right foot is a shoe number 35, mm -hmm. uh, the right one, 42, 43. Probably in the UK, you use different, uh, different numbers, right? But basically my left foot is a bit crippled. Okay. So um, this made my childhood a bit difficult because I always wanted to, be, wanted to be one of the cool kids. And, you know, like back in the days when you're like 11, 12, like the cool kids, always the very athletic kids. But I was barely able to run properly. So, you know, I was never one of the very cool kids, so to say. So because of this, when I was uh, 13, 14, um, I wanted to have like a six pack, like all the other cool, cool guys. So I asked one of my school friends, hey, how can I have a six pack? And he told me, yeah, just eat less and move more. You know, I was like, that, that's quite easy. But little did I know, even back in the days, I was a guy that goes into the extremes pretty quickly. So what I did, I just like stopped eating, um, just ate probably 800 calories a day, made a lot of like, did a lot of sports. I mean, the things I was able to do. And uh, at the end, I, I weighed uh, 41 kilos. At, at what age? Uh, at age 14. Okay, 14. Five, five foot seven and uh, 90 pounds. So uh, obviously got diagnosed with anorexia because there's nothing else you can say, basically, you know. Um, but then, of course, I was like, okay, I need, I need to be healthy. Went to some psychologists and I had to like learn how to eat properly from the ground, ground up at age 15. And that's how I got into the bodybuilding fitness scene. Because back in the days, there were just like these bodybuilding forums. Mm -hmm. You know, there was not really. I mean, I think Matt, o Matt August was there back in 20, 2010. Matt August, Frank Yang, and this guy Scooby, I think he was we called. Like yeah, 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 Scooby. Yeah. Way back in the days. Yeah, so I basically had to track on a piece of paper because there was no my fitness pole there. So I, I tracked back in 2010 because I had anorexia, but I wanted to like become healthy. So I used this anorexia kind of mindset, this all or nothing mindset in the gym. And uh, I, I built muscle from there. And this became a big passion because I realized, oh, wow, like, because, because, of, because of my little handicap, I was never like the other kids, the other people. I was different. 
But in the gym, I realized, okay, in the gym, if I just work hard, if I just keep, keep, keep hustling, I, I, can, I can become someone, at least at the gym. And this really opened the gate for me into personal development, into business, into all these things, because I realized, okay, like the, the, the growth mindset is a thing, right? To come from anorexia to like good, solid body is probably the same as coming from like, I don't know, college education or like self-made to like millionaire, you know, to zero to a million. It's probably easier to maybe beat anorexia than become a millionaire. Mm. So that's my first, I think it was a very, like looking back, it was a very, very good experience. I had to go for this. Yeah, I had the same thing. I was diagnosed, well, I'm not diagnosed by it as anything, but I blacked out three times, passed out oh, well. from consuming, I'd say like 600 calories per day tops to the ages of 15 to 17. I didn't know that. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Very similar thing, but mm -hmm. I was still competing at a very high level with tennis and also other sports like cross country. I was doing nationally as well. So my calorie expenditure was through the roof for oh, both. Wow. So I was training probably in total about four hours per day and that includes tra training the gym, but I'd still consume such a little amount of calories that, yeah. And then, um, I tried to convince my parents I was eating healthy, but the reality was I just wasn't eating anything. That's mm. how that started. But that was that was a control thing because I, I hated education. Me too. I hated education. Yeah, yeah I hate yeah. it. To this I day, hate I, hate, I, I hate to have an authority over me. I hate really? it. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm not so much the case now, but okay. yeah, just in, in school specifically, I just saw no point in tests or yeah. learning about this information, which had no benefit to my life long term. By the so, way, I'm, I'm curious. Like what I did with my parents, my, my, my mom asked me at, at lunch, uh, do you like did you eat something beforehand so what I used to do is during uh, breakfast I ate a little bit and then at school I, tell, I told everyone yeah I ate a lot on, uh, during breakfast I'm not hungry and then at lunch I was like yeah I ate something before I'm not that hungry and I just this was my excuse yeah was it similar for you very similar except I'd eat uh, the protein source and then I'd kind of like throw away the rest of the food discreetly yeah so I like, also did stuff like this yeah yeah even at tables I'd have a bag next to my like right leg and I'd pour away the food progressively while just eating the protein source interesting yeah, yeah that's, that's surprising man that's surprising okay yeah, yeah no it was, it was it was bad but it was just control thing because I, I just hated yeah. education I, I didn't feel in control of it whatever whatsoever so that was that aspect of things okay man so both similar kind of perspective which is interesting mm -hmm. so of course in terms of higher education you you went to that stage yet so we're still at the 14 to 15 kind of stage what mm -hmm. happened to higher education because in the uk education goes to the age of 18 it's compul it's compulsory you have to attend education until you're 18 is mm -hmm. that the same way you grew up or is that somewhat different uh yeah in switzerland you need to attend education till the age of 16 okay yeah so 16 and then did you further education or did you stop there yeah i started a psychological degree okay but i just started i dropped out after one and a half years because i realized not the life i want to live sure and were you working a job at the time or were you just a student yeah yeah no i was a student and then after i worked at several jobs one of them was like garbage man like i was sitting on a garbage truck and all these things like i had several jobs after that yeah okay man yeah. interesting yeah. And so at what point did you then quit that job or did you quit your other like part-time jobs and your, your student education? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I was, uh, you mean the university or yeah. which ones? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, university, uh, probably one year in, I realized, okay, it's not the thing I want to do. So then I, I quit and I, I jobbed on the side and I, I thought I, I want to become a personal trainer. So I did a personal trainer education, but it's funny. I told my best friend, Flo Florian, which I'm also traveling with. He is also an entrepreneur. I told him like the first day, I mean, I had another job before I was a personal trainer. I had like a job in a, in a factory. I tell you like the first day I was at this factory job, I, I swore to myself, that's not the way I want to live. I hate to have a job. Like even then I was like, I need to find a way to find something else. Yeah. Like it was like killing me from the inside. Literally. Like I looked at people that had a job. I was like, How can these people do it? You know, like, I admire yeah. people. Like I admire people that can have a job. I cannot do it, man. It, I go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like to be honest. So how old were you qualified as PT? I think 23, 22, something like this. Oh, okay. So slightly older. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And then you got your first personal training job straight out the bat. How did that happen? What, what happened next? That's a super funny story. I, um, I, I was supposed to get a job. But if I re remember correctly, um, I decided to move out of Switzerland. I wanted to live in Berlin and I got a job offer to work somewhere else because I had a, one day I was at the gym. I worked for free just to see how it is. But then I realized basically just talking to customers, selling their, their program, and then you know people buy the, the membership, but they're not really trained there. So it's basically scamming people. So I was like, oh man, it's, it's weird. It doesn't go along with my values. So then I moved out of Switzerland, went to Berlin got a job as a what was it rec recruiter or something like this and then in berlin in 2020 i started to build my online fitness business because i realized there's nothing else i want to do in my life i want to be free on one side but i still want to utilize this personal trainer and nutrition knowledge and was that all online or was that in person at the same time because that was the start of the pandemic right so yeah all all online yeah all online okay all yeah. online at that yeah. time yeah yeah interesting so you went 
so you qualified as an in-person personal trainer didn't actually do in-person pt and then i never did online. It. yeah yeah that's really interesting man yeah okay no, i never did it. okay cool so how long were you working in recruitment in berlin not that long i think about half a year probably half okay yeah. okay cool and what was your introduction to online personal training like or online fitness coaching was it difficult did you have ease with it at first like what I was, was that whole experience i like to be honest with you i was extremely lucky to this day because i was following a guy his name is mario tomic very very smart guy we probably you saw him probably also on youtube yeah. and he told people that he's looking for for clients because he wants to become a fitness entrepreneur coach of uh, online fitness entrepreneur coach yeah uh yeah something like yeah online fitness entrepreneur coach sorry and uh i was really privileged because he closed his program after getting four clients so i was one of four and i think it was the first guy he got and uh, i was with him for two years straight because I just okay. realized how much value I got from him. So um, he helped me from the start. Like, I, I mean, I think in 2017, this was 2020, you know, 2017 already started to be an online coach. I tried it out, but I realized for me, it was too hard to figure it out on my own. You know, it's, it's, it was way too hard, all the sales skills and everything. So I had to take a coach. Sure. I took more. So that, okay, man. So that's throughout that two-year process, we operate in the low ticket model or high ticket model initially? Even a high ticket. I mean, I charged 2000 bucks for six months, like high ticket-ish. Sure. And were you always working with female clients or was it an abundance of different no, people? No, no. Funny story. I wanted to work with, uh, with men first. Mm -hmm. So I started to post content online and then my marketing coach, I mean, I had Mario for the sales and fitness coaching and then Fritz, shout out to Fritz, my marketing coach. He told me to share my story, you know, so people can relate to me. So I, sh I shared my anorexia story, my eating disorder story. And funny enough, more and more women started to reach out. And I was like, what is going on? And Fritz said, yeah, of course, because more women struggle, more women can relate with your struggles. Yeah. Not that many guys struggle with the thing we struggled with. So then I had 50, 50, I mean, in 2020, I had only guys. And then end of 2020 was 50, 50. And then beginning of 2021, I went all in with, with only women. Okay. Man. And what was the progression of your business like throughout that two year time period? So how did it start? What was the kind of middle, middle aspect of that like then the, towards the end of that two year period? Do you mean their like revenue? That? What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, revenue. And then also more specifically in terms of delivery. And then I suppose business difficulty that you faced or how yeah. you then dealt with the obstacles it's you had to overcome. That's a very good question because it's going to be extremely helpful for, for all the guys starting out. So my, yeah. my star was my star was crazy, man. Like uh, I can tell you the whole story; it's hilarious. Like I worked at this recruitment uh, job, right? And the funny thing is, I always knew how human the human mind works. So I knew, like, if I'm in a job that I earn too much money with, I will not be able to quit that job. So I need to find a job where I earn little a li little amount of money. So I I'm, I need to like like stop it and find something else. So. At my job in Berlin, I only earned uh, 1.3k euros a month, you know. So I earned okay. so little that I, I was I was angry and I had to change. So I got I got my coach Mario, and then uh, it was it was so bad, man. I mean, I, I can I can say it openly. Like I had to work uh, remote for my day job, but I knew sooner or later I need to I need to quit that day job. So in my mind, I was like, okay, like I can work eight hours at my day job and build my business on the side. Or I just work one hour at my day job and build my business the other seven hours and just get fired. It makes more sense. <laughs> so that, that's what I did, unfortunately. Unfortunately, for everyone listening, I'm sorry to, to tell about. Yeah, because I was like, yeah, you know, I could, I could die. I could die the next day and these people would not even care. Maybe some people come to my funeral, my old boss, but then the next day they find someone else. So I had to make a decision. Do I care more about my time or their time? And my, my time was worth nothing. 1.3K a month, man. My, my, my time was worth nothing. So I just like worked one hour at my day job. I still did a pretty good job with my work ethic. I probably was still one of the average performers in, the, in that company. Not the best, but the average average performance. So then in November, they, they called me. They were like, hey, you know, like you did a bad job. We need to like fire you. But uh, what I did is, um, you know, the, the book by Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference? Yeah. Yeah. So basically used his email, email um, template, which was so cool because my boss was like, yeah, first we were angry at you, but then we read your email and we need to like agree if you, yeah, you're right. You know, it was really good. Like it was, it was pretty, we, we parted in very good ways because of that Chris Voss email. And then in November, 2020 was the first month I started officially. So how it, how it started is um, I had 1.3K every month for my day job. And then August, my first month with the online business, I made 1K in August. I made 2.2K with, uh, um, with my business in uh, September. And then October also 2.6K or something. And then I was like, okay, I make double amount of my day job. So let's quit the day job so I can fully focus on it, you know, even more. Then I quit. And then November, I made 3.5K, something like this. Mm -hmm. December again, 2. Point something. Then January, February, March, 
uh, January, February, March, and April. No, just January, February, and March. I was pivoting a bit between 2 and 4K. And then April was my first month with 6.4K euros. And then um, in June 2021, I hit my first 10K. So after nine months of starting it. Awesome. And that was all organic? Everything organic, 100% organic. So how are you acquiring customers at that time? Through which traffic source or rather through which social media I need to platforms. be honest, like it will sound so bad. I was such a newbie at business, but it will, it will give people hope because I was such a newbie. <laughs> so bad. What I did is I didn't even text people. I had no, no, no texting, no outreach. What I did, I just did a call-up post once a month, wrote very good content at this time. And every month, like three to six people reached out. But I had a very big advantage. I'm, I'm actually good at sales and social skills. So I had a sales rate of like between 60 and 80 percent most most months 50 to 80 so like two to three people enrolled consistently you know which yeah. gave me like a, it was, it was kind of lucky it was kind of lucky because it helped me to like always sustain myself every month so, so why, why weren't you reaching out to prospects at that i time? was just i think i was uh, i don't want to say i was too dumb but i just didn't get it like i was in the business calls with my mentors and i just just don't know just like didn't didn't didn't, you f- didn't get it and focus in i was like i don't know why, why honestly were, were those day. mentors telling you to outreach to prospects yeah but i think i need, I need to go back to the, all these group calls i think not consciously i think it's hard to tell why i think maybe for the mentors it was so obvious they just mentioned it like i said outreach but i think my business vocabulary was not there i just didn't register you know mm. i was probably focused so much on like the the content and the videos yeah. And the coaching, the first clients that I just like just went over my head. So I think I did code outreach like in January or February 2021. I started. And you did your first 10K mark for how many followers? Uh, followers, good question. On Instagram, I had 4K followers still, but half of them speak English. But now I'm marketing to German speakers. So I would say like 2,000 solid followers on Instagram, 4,000 on Facebook, 100 on YouTube. Yeah, it's just uh, funny because people will find that hard to believe. Yeah, is me it, too. In the, be- in the beginning, I found it very hard to believe, extremely hard to believe. Really? Yeah. Why was yeah. that? I mean, no, no business background. I had my father, my mother, like no business. No one was a business owner in my family, you know, like, oh, how, how, is, how is that possible? You know, like the belief system was not there. So, okay. So for past that period of time, so June or July that year, did you then start to leverage outreach and therefore facilitate more growth in your business? Or were you still resistant to that and therefore leveraged inbound prospects more frequently? Still more inbound. More inbound. Still- I would say honestly, like 2022, since my girlfriend is doing it, like now we, I do it more consistently. I would say. Really? Only as recently as then? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And still made 10 grand, you know, like it <laughs> doesn't seem to be that difficult. Yeah. No, it's uh, interesting, man. It's definitely interesting. <laughs> but to I be honest, go- to interrupt you, like I think my, it's my brand that is extremely strong because of my background in anorexia. Mm. You know, it's, it's kind of my USP. So I think that's also the reason why like people come to me. They're like, oh yeah, I resonate so much with your content. And I was always, always very, vulnerable in my in my content delivery so i think that that made the difference in, in my situation sure so how old were you investing in your first mentor how much how old were you with mario i was 26 i believe yeah and what made you invest with him and then fritz apologies for interrupting this podcast we hope you're enjoying this episode so far thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to or watch this podcast We hope you're enjoying the conversation and are, of course, extracting tremendous amounts of value from it. If you haven't already done so, we'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to this channel, drop this podcast a like and share it with anyone that you may know who's wanting to build a career in the fitness industry. And let us know who you'd like to see on as a guest of ours in the comments section down below. Let's get back to the podcast. As coaches, what made you want to enroll in their products? That's a very good question. Like, a lot of trust. I met him twice in real life. I saw his growth on YouTube since 2015. And I, I mean, the biggest thing was probably we have the same, almost the same values. That's also why I came to you because I realized we have almost the same values. That was mm. a big thing for me. Yeah. Value, values in what respect? The way you live your life, the way you, you structure your business. What kind, because you also post personal stuff on your story. You yeah. know, also, yeah, like your dog, my, my girlfriend's favorite dog uh, species, like the Dachshund, you know, like the, the dog you have. And just the little things, because there are a lot of online fitness coaches there. But uh, it's like, I mean, I see your personal life. I'm like, oh, yeah, same values, you know, like normal guy. I think I, ha- I had to know that uh, you can relate to my, to my lifestyle, kind of to my personality. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting because I invested in my first mentor when I was 19. Mm-hmm. All the money I had, 
I won't mention the guy's name because he's a total scammer, but uh-huh. um, it was a diabolical product. And it's just interesting yeah. seeing why I bought his product in the first place yeah. in terms of the psychological aspect of that and what contributed towards it at the time. Yeah. Also yeah. my trust in human humans at the same time in terms of humanity, <laughs> investing yeah. in a product without having any guarantee in place, mistake. Yeah. And Massive also something I, want, something I want to add here, if, if guys are thinking to, to, to get coached by you, because I was broke when I got Mario as my coach. I was broke. I had some money in crypto, but I didn't want to like invest that. So I was, I was broke. I think I had 2000 bucks on my, to my name. <clears throat> so what happened was I went to my mother back then because my mother, unfortunately, she, she passed away last year. I think your father also like recently passed away also last year, right? Yeah. 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 But before she passed away, I was like, hey, mom, I need 5000 bucks for online coaching, you know? And then my mother didn't flinch any second. She was like, yeah, how much? 5000 Let's go to the bank. Went to the bank the same day, talk, got the money. I was like, whoa, crazy. I was like, yeah, you can pay, pay it back one day, you know, even though she never meant it. Made my, my started with, that, with these five grand, you know? And all these five grand are worth, I don't know, like 100, 200 K. You know, to this day, every every time before I go into a sales call with a potential client, I look to, I look to, to outside the window and I thank my mother. You know, like, yeah, it's uh, amazing. I almost have tears saying this because she believed me more than I did. You know, and now I'm here, like it's crazy, dude. That's amazing, man. That's a very yeah. unique situation to be in in terms of the amount of support you receive from your your mum. Yeah, to this day, like you know, it's just like a fucking blessing. Yeah, that's so interesting. So I I didn't have that whatsoever. <laughs> mm. I had the bet with my parents that I could defer my university degree for a year, provided that I made more money than them in my first year of business. Wow. More money than your parents, you mean? Yeah. Individually, wow. not, not wow. combined, because obviously that'd be combined earnings and income. I, I want yeah. to ask you, I'm also curious about your life because, you know, also very, exp- um, very interesting guy because you're very young and still that successful. What, what made you this way? Are you, are you born this way? Did something happen when you were younger or what? What's, or did your father like kind of influence you? What was going on? No, 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 no. Not my parents at all. Um, I think the interesting aspect of that is, and I've I heard Alex refer to this the other day in a podcast. Majority of individuals these met the very successful suffer with crippling insecurity, uh, a, a, I suppose like a, a self belief complexity syndrome to the extent where they think they're superior to most individuals, and also think they're not good enough constantly. It's the three battles they have on a daily basis. I've always had that as a kid, mm. very much so. So uh, I, it's something I became very aware of at a very young age. I mm-hmm. think honestly is going as far back to like six and seven years old. Wow. It was, it was yeah. pretty early. I didn't yeah. really feel like I fit in with most kids at school because I, I just didn't want to talk to people. <laughs> that mm-hmm. sounds really odd, mm-hmm. but um, I didn't really want to socialize. I just kind of want to do my own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then, but nonetheless, I was still interested in helping other people. So my parents are very liberal in terms of their political stance. They always encouraged me to help charities and things like this. So I wrote a book for a, a charity at the time called Great Ormond Street and then raised loads of money for them when I was a kid and things like this. Mm-hmm. So I kind of, I always saw that I wanted to help other people and that kind of inspired my positioning with regards to wanting to them pursue a career in fitness and helping people as a personal trainer, et cetera, because I really enjoyed it. I thrived off it massively, but nice. I always saw more opportunity out there and therefore that kind of drove me to the, the next position. But I'm a very competitive character. I can, I can tell, yeah, I can tell. Yeah, yeah. so anything I commit myself to. So by no means my, I think, naturally athletic, by any means, not, not mm-hmm. whatsoever. I was very asthmatic as a kid. I've had probably about eight to 10 asthma attacks um, to the extent where, yeah, I was in hospital for like two weeks at a time just with asthma alone. But I also have a, I'm anaphylactic to nuts. So I was very ill as a kid. So with asperger's attacks, right? Asperger's? Uh, no, anaphy- anaphylactic. So I'm allergic to nuts. So they can kill me. Yeah, I think so it can kill had- you. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, okay. So I've had that experience twice nearly mm-hmm. which is pretty terrifying but i think that that this all contributed because i was i had a very weak immune system as a kid and therefore i kind of aspired to be more healthy when i was growing up and as a result of that i pursued more athletic pursuits at a very young age so like you know 11 12 13 growing up and wanted to be yep. the best at, at athletics and sport and yep. yeah then it just applied to my professional life i think it's kind of how it all started it's a common denominator i realize all these exceptional guys or people that had like some little trauma back in the days you know yeah yeah very much so and insecurity as a result of that Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. yeah, but but also combined with superiority complex as a result of what they've achieved. What is it called? Age. Say it again. It's which one? Which complex? A superiority complex. A superiority. Like okay. Yeah. Better than other people to an extent. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. I think I think you somewhat need that in terms of confidence being applied to things. It's not necessarily negative. I, think I mean, me too. Positive. Like I, I had the entitlement to say, okay, I want to become a coach. I, I need to be uh, an entrepreneur. You know, I cannot have a job. Almost like you're yeah. too good. For, it sounds bad. Too good for a job. You want some other life, of course. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. And also to tap on that point. So I lost my dad and obviously you lost your mother. How, how did you deal with that experience? At, you know, losing I, hoped, at a young age? I hoped you would ask me because even my friend Florian, like to this day, all the guys are like, you, you dealt with this so, so well. Like, how did you do it? So uh, I'm a big fan of the book, A Man's Search for Meaning. Have you heard of this book? I have heard of it, but I haven't read it. 
It's by Viktor Frankl. Actually, tomorrow I will visit his, uh, his museum in Vienna. So Viktor Frankl was a psychologist that survived three concentration camps. One of them was Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And in his book, he talks about that if you have a specific suffering in your life, you need to find meaning for this suffering. As soon as you can find meaning in your suffering, you can overcome every suffering pretty quickly. So as soon as I read that book in 2014, always when something kind of bad happened to me, I was always re reframing it. You know, so I was combining it with uh, something Tony Robbins talks about. I think you know the guy, right? Tony Robbins. Yeah. Yeah. And he talks about like the power of questions. So every time something bad happened to me, I was telling myself, or asking myself, why is this the best thing that ever happened to me? Because of these mm -hmm. questions. The second one was, how can I grow from it? You know, and the third one I, I stole from the book from Victor Frankl is, why is this meaningful? What's the meaning of the situation? So every time something bad happens to me, I try to answer one of these three questions because your brain will always come up with an answer. Depressed people ask themselves, why me? Why is life unfair? Why this always happens to me? Blah, blah, blah. You know, depressed people ask themselves this. So obviously like something like a breakup is pretty easy. When you break up with a girl or she breaks up with you, you're like, okay, I will find a better woman. And then you find like your girlfriend, Brittany, I, I found my girlfriend. You're like, okay, cool. Good that this thing happened. So now I found someone better. So it's pretty easy to rationalize. Mm -hmm. But using, using your father or your mother is something very, very hard to answer. But I had to lock that I mean, like my mother always told me that I'm the reason why she's still alive because I'm an only child. She was always telling me that I'm the reason I'm, she's still alive. And um, the month she passed away, April 2021, on the 30th, 30th of April, this was also the best month in my business at that time. So to this day, I remember, I think it was a couple of days before she died or maybe a couple of weeks. I don't remember when, but she said, now I finally don't need to worry anymore about you. That's the first time I heard, that say, I heard her say that. You know, mm. and then um, a couple of days, days or weeks, I don't remember exactly, but she passed away a couple of days probably after that, right? Then I was like, oh wow, it's harsh, but probably you know she fulfilled her her um, task on this earth. Mm. And then suddenly, like I had one day where I cried like a shit ton. In the, I was living in Poland back then. I was in Warsaw. I was crying so much. Why? Why now? Why now? Made a made a tattoo, you know, with her signature and everything. Um, but after this, I, I dealt pretty well with it because I was like, yeah, probably her meaning on this earth was fulfilled. That's why she was alive to give me life and to give my business a head start, to give me a head start and to impact more people. And I, I openly talk about the way I, I deal with it because I want to other people to read that book. You know, maybe she had to die so other people can hear that message and you know get value from this message. Um, because also what, what helped also was her her favorite sister passed away a couple of months before, and you know, like she didn't have that many things to like look for. So, you know, probably had, had to die as bad as it sounds. And then, I mean, to this day, it's, I mean, you know, it's hard. Sometimes I get reminded, I cry a little bit. And I think like, yeah, it would be cool if she sees her grand, would see her grandkids and stuff, you know. But yeah. the, the, the way I dealt with it, I'm just like, because I was not able to ask myself, why is this the best thing that ever happened to me? You could do that with a breakup, but not with your mother or your father passing away, just disrespectful. But I asked myself, why is this meaningful? You know, and when I had the speech at her funeral, I mentioned the quote by um, Steve Jobs. He says, you can just connect the dots looking backwards, not looking forwards. And her, her life purpose was probably to give me life as, as hard as it sounds and to you know, give me a head start in business and to make me successful. Mm. That's super interesting. Man. And what about your relationship with other family members? I mean, the thing is, unfortunately, like a lot of people of my family died last year. My grandmother died. My grandfather died. Uh, two aunts, the aunts died. I basically only have my father left. And the relationship is, is uh, pretty good. He's very stoic. He's very happy. He's living his life. We call every two weeks, every 10 days. I see him twice a year. He's, he supports me in my business. It's very good, but unfortunately, I don't have that many family members left. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. almost alone, which is on the one side harsh, but it's hard, but it's also kind of freeing because For no, freeing. No, yeah, no, no responsibility. Like I can do whatever I want. I can go to Thailand tomorrow, like whatever, you know, my father, my father told me, just make sure you have enough money. If you have kids and no kids, he doesn't care. You yeah. Know? So yeah, it's, 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 it's harsh, but it's pretty freeing, you know, no responsibility almost. Yeah, no, it's, it's super interesting because I, I experienced very similar things, but my dad passed away in 2020. So the start of the pandemic. So piece of, piece of cancer, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so harsh. after yeah. about two years. And yeah. then died two weeks before the first lockdown. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting in times of t turmoil. <laughs> it was total chaos. So mm -hmm. at the funeral, people were coming down from London to my mum lives in the South Coast. And they were mentioning that, you know, lockdown was impending and it was going to be put in place very soon. And we had no idea what was happening. So we obviously were in a total chaotic experience. Yep. It was pandemonium. And then, um, yeah, lockdown was put in place. And I remember, so I, I was staying with my parents at the time to make sure my mum was okay, my brother. I saw my flat in central London, but I just wanted to be back on my own and somewhat isolated so I could actually process what happened. 
that wasn't the case with those two. And it was balancing that dynamic because very difficult. Because I, I think our approach, a collective approach and shared approach towards life is very different from most other people. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And somewhat yeah. criticized. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, I never saw my father cry. My father cried so many times. I never saw him cry. It was a pretty humbling experience as well. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I never saw my father. I remember I was at a table and we had to like choose the card for people to be sent out with like the phrase, you know, the little quote. He burst out in tears once or twice. I was like, damn, I had to like manage the whole thing, you know. Mm. It's it sounds it sounds very bad, but um, since my mother passed away, I also truly feel like a man finally. It, it's harsh, but you know, when you have like your mother, she's always like, hey, are you like, did you eat? Are you, you know, she's asking you. But now I, ha- I have no other person asking me. I mean, maybe my girlfriend, but you know, it was a very like, it wasn't like my rite of passage was my mother passing away, unfortunately, mm. you know. But I felt like the first time in my life, I felt like, okay, now I'm alone. Like I need to make things happen. So I think it's no coincidence that two months after my mom passed away, I made my first 10K revenue because I was like, oh, wow, now I need, on one side, I was like, okay, now I'm alone. Now I really need to make it happen. And second of all, I was also like, I want to show the world what kind of man she, she put on this earth, you know? Hmm. So I was like, yeah, let's, let's make, make some legacy happen, you know, because at the end of the day, no one, no one cares. I mean, it's harsh, but no one of my clients really cares if my mother passed away or not. They want to get the results, right? Well, so no one on the planet does. No one cares, dude. So I was like, you either give them the results or you, or you, or you grieve. So I was like, I can grieve and still make money, you know, like it's harsh, but I still can. So it was a, it was a harsh time, but man, it really like, I, I, I grew so much. Like it's crazy. Like it was really like a, a rite of passage for me personally. This might sound somewhat sadistic. Did you enjoy that time period in terms of growth? <sighs> Fortunately, yeah. Yeah, no, I can resonate with that. <laughs> so. yeah. No, it's it's, it's funny because I'll be criticised for saying that by certain individuals that I'm what well, I'm connected to or close to, definitely. But I, I found it very beneficial and positive, and I only f- felt benefit from that time period. Uh, with and whilst it, experiencing yeah. immense loss, don't get yeah. me wrong, and tremendous yeah. amounts of loss which no one would want to g- go through necessarily. Yeah. However, I feel like as a result of that, things start to align. Uh, yeah, like for, to, to be honest, like it's harsh to say. I mean, it's harsh that my mother passed away, but still I had almost like the best time of my life because I was making money. I was still go- going over the grief, but I really grew. I really had to become a man, you know, like no excuse anymore, no safety net, no excuses, you know, 20 yeah. clients. Like I had to. And the interesting thing is also, it's like so fucked up, but I, I broke up with my ex-girlfriend on Monday and on, on, uh, on Friday, my mother passed away, you know. Yeah, and ex- that's pretty much exactly the same as me. Ah, crazy, crazy. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I had to make a decision: do I go back to her or not? And she was begging me, "Come back, come back." But I was like, in my mind, I was like, I need to show the universe what kind of man I am. I need to leave every, leave everything behind. So what I did is I cut all the ties with her. I came back to Poland after the funeral. I had no friends, and the two weeks, no, three weeks after that, I saw my girlfriend walking around on the street. I approached her on the street, took her Instagram. Three days later, had our first date. She became my, my girlfriend and, you know, took it from there. Like I was like, I need, I need to make stuff happen. I'm single, have almost, I mean, no money. I had some money. I need to make clients. I had 2.6K revenue that month. I need to make stuff happen. My mother passed away, but no one cares. But it really like made me grow up hardcore, man. You know, like, sure. I, yeah, I wish my mother would not pass away. It's a harsh thing to say. It was, it was a good time, but mentally it was harsh. But and also like, it was, I, I grew so much, man. Like it's, it's, it is what it is. I had to make the best out of it. And I truly did. How, how did you deal with the lowest points? The reason why I ask that question is because in terms of the interaction I have with individuals within our product, for example, they have difficulty dealing with anything that's somewhat traumatic. So for example, relationships breaking down and as a result of that impedes their business entirely for the next month in mm-hmm. terms of their inability to actually show up every single day. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting to see the difference between individuals that don't experience that whatsoever and therefore crack on and get on with things they need to get on with and other individuals that tend to, in my opinion, avoid the responsibility. So mm-hmm. how did you deal with the lowest points of that grieving period? Was, was there any particular that you were just rocked by or how, how, what did that look like? Um, I'm a big fan of the book Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. I've probably, you've probably read it, right? I haven't read it, no. Nassim Taleb. So as, as soon as I read that book, he talks about the three types of people fragile robust anti-fragile so if you're a fragile person you break break down automatically and something that happens and you need to build yourself up to the same level if you're robust you break down later but you still like need to work your way up if you're if you're anti-fragile you start out as a person that is still fragile but every time you break you become you become stronger and stronger and stronger and since i read that book in my mind i'm like okay like now every time something bad happens i need to i need to kind of make the best out of it so it's very harsh to say but every time something really bad happens to me 
one of my first thoughts is just like, oh yes, let's get it on, man. Now it's time to like really show the world what kind of person I am. So I made a joke the other day. I told my friend Florian, like when I broke up with my ex-girlfriend, I was like, hey, if, I, if, I, if she breaks up with me or I break up with her, I will be a millionaire after this. It was like a mm. running gag I had. And I oh, know probably not, but if it happens again, I will be for sure. Like, I mean, I'll probably be a probably millionaire anyway, inflation and all these things. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's my, my mind is always something bad happens. I'm like, let's get it on. Let's get it on. You know, like, I don't know, like it's, it's harsh, but no one cares about your traumas, man. Like in this society, it's either you win or you lose. It's one or zero, you know, no one cares. Well, there's nothing else to do other than crack on. And make progress. There's nothing else to do other than crack on and make progress yeah. towards what you want to I mean, work of, of course, of, Yeah, of course you can crack. And then I talk to my best friends and, you know, and then he talks, he cracks. Even when my mother passed away, I was, I, I cried in front of my friends. Of course it was a harsh time, but then, then I made, I made jokes again and yeah, I need to go on, you know, and all these things and just, just, just went on. Like it is, it, it, it is how it is. You know, a lot of people want to be in the position we are in. So we compete with a lot of people. So we just need to deliver. And, but the cool thing is also the cool thing. It sounds sadistic, but if something really bad happens to you, that's exactly the moment when you train your mindset. I have this running gag with my friend Florian. He always says, yeah, let's train our mindset. Let's do it. You know, and I'm, I'm sick right now with a little bit of a headache and stuff, but still having my five calls to them. Like I can train my mindset when I'm like sick. I can train my mindset. When my girlfriend breaks up, I can train my mindset. When my mother passes away, that's like the ultimate 100 kilo bench press, press for your mindset. You know, if your, mother, if your mother passed away, your father passed away, but the next day you can still have a sales call and still like make the sale or not. Like, man, like, you train your mindset hardcore, it became, becomes your new anchor. So I'm always very, very passionate about going to the next level also with my mindset, you know? Sure. And how is that translated into your business with regards to your desire for further revenue growth? Because from my opinion, obviously prior to, you know, you fit your record month whilst enrolled in our product, which is great. But yeah. prior to that point, it seems like there was somewhat stagnation in your business in terms of revenue not being spiking or growing consistently. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you deal with that psychologically? Because you don't uh, seem to be- Ups and downs. Yeah, because you don't seem mm. to be a person that's very happy with dips in terms of your growth. So how, how have you dealt with that personally? Mm, that's a very good point. I like that. That's a very good question. I mean, I need to be honest. My business is not my number one value in my life. You know, like it's, it's for me, it's not like it's not, not it's not really breaking my mood if I make a little bit less revenue. I, I look at it like at the, at a yearly basis. If I, if I make more month this month than the, the last month in 2021, I'm happy. If not, I try, I try to make my, my best the next month, but my business is not my number one, like value in life, you know, like, so for me, it's, it doesn't break me if I don't make that much pro. It's just, I think it's part of, it's part of the journey. Like the gym, sometimes you have bad workouts. I think sometimes you have good workouts, but I just try to show up every day and do my, my habits, you know, outreach videos, everything. And I kind of, I think I trust the process that in a year I will be in a better position than now. So what, what is your, what's yeah. your biggest priority in your life then? If, if work isn't. The thing is, I mean, my number one value is, is freedom right now. Um, but to be honest, that's so interesting. I mean, I mean, if peace so my number one value is freedom. Yeah. That's why I can never have a job. Even when my, it's harsh, right? my girlfriend will laugh because she probably listens to the podcast. Even if she tells me to do something, I'm like, wait, what? Like, what is going on? I hate when people tell me what to do. My freedom is my number one value. Um, but how it translates to the business, it's hard to tell because it, it fluctuates for me. But I, what I usually tend to do is, for one or one to three months, I'll do an immersion with business, like right now with you. And then I have a maintenance phase where I focus on some other ones of my life, life area. You know, as an example for people listening, um, I always wanted to have a lifestyle business. So for me to be between 10 and 20K a month for me is totally fine. But then what I do is I make a boxing immersion, for example. Before I did the business, I did boxing. I never was able to like fight in like combat sports. So I was training with a prof professional female boxer from Poland, you know, like one-on-one -on -one coaching for like three or four months straight. You know, and before so, that, sorry. Yeah, I'm not really curious. So you mentioned that your objective is to build a lifestyle business. Yes. I first, I really respect that the fact that you're open and transparent about that also, because I think the majority of people aren't, even if they do want to do a lifestyle business yep. and those, they, they lie to themselves fundamentally, which is a mistake on their part. Mm -hmm. So in terms of then uh, looking forward, are you going to maintain this level of growth in your business for the next five to 10 years? Or are you wanting to reach the, the million dollar a month mark? What, what is your pursuit in business respect? Honestly, I don't know how human nature works. So I know that probably in a couple of years, I will, I will want to push further. 
But as for now, I think the most likely case will be that maybe a transition to like dating coaching for women. Because I'm, I'm just, I love coaching in general. My friend Florian makes fun of me also because he's like a guy like he wants to make a million a year, 10 million. He wants to be a billionaire. He talks about the billion. You know, does, does, doesn't excite me at all. It sounds like a lot of stress. I don't like stress too much. So for me, it's a 10, 20K with fitness, maybe in transition to dating and also push that business uh, to 20, 30K. But for me right now, I would say most likely scenario, probably still push it step by step, but uh, at my own pace, because I'm, all, I'm also don't have the best work ethic. Like, like you said, I was lying to myself as well when I was younger. Yeah, Gary V lifestyle, like hustle here, hustle there. But I also don't have the best work ethic. So I think at the end of the day, it comes down to knowing yourself, knowing what values you have, what you want to do, hmm. and, and then just go for it, right? So I think probably lifestyle business and then pivoting maybe some other business, but probably still having like 10, 20, 30K. So, yeah, so when you refer to your lack of work ethics, you've been hovering around 10K per month the last year or so. How mm-hmm. many hours per day on average are you working to maintain that level of growth? Maybe three hours a day, something like this. Okay, super interesting. Yeah, two to three hours. I don't like, again, my, my friend should be here, makes fun of me. Like, I, I probably on average, I mean, right now I work more, but usually like two to three hours. I, mean, I would say now it's like five, maybe. Yeah, but I I, re- like, I mean calls not included of course, but I don't I don't work that much. For me, it was not my number one value. So what are you doing in the time period throughout the day? But let's exclude those five hours in which you're not working. If you're listening to or watching our podcast, my guess is that you're obsessed with all things gym and fitness, just like us, and would love nothing more than to make money and build a career in the fitness industry, doing something you love. You're a full time personal trainer, eager to start, grow, and scale your online fitness coaching business. Perhaps you're working a nine to five job and are longing to turn your passion for health and fitness into a massively profitable business. For those of you that didn't know, Brittany and I run a company together called Info Productions and we help fitness coaches build a massively profitable online fitness coaching businesses, just like the one I scaled to $30,000 a month at the age of 20. As you can see on screen, our client Oliver has just informed us that he is celebrating his biggest month in business yet by generating £22,500 in one month. He had earned in a month what he had previously earned in a year in his old corporate job. Josh, who informed me during his onboarding call that he's always been passionate about health and fitness, which is what led to him pursuing a career as an online fitness coach, has just informed us that he's generated $8,700 for his online fitness coaching business this month. Our client Raj has just signed a new client for $4,800. Charles has just informed us he's hit a new revenue PR this month and collected $14,600 for his online fitness coaching business. Through our coaching program, we teach our clients how to build an online coaching offer that serves a prospect that's in pain, that has access to capital, that is easy to identify on social media, and is part of a growing market. This enables our clients to charge a premium for their service, just as Billy did as an online fitness coach. Upload problem and pain solving content that adds value to the lives of their prospects and ensures that our coaches are perceived as authorities on the social media platforms that ideal clients use. Learn how to leverage our organic traffic acquisition strategies and systems. I scaled my business to $30,000 a month organically without the use of any paid traffic. This is the exact system we teach our clients to leverage to grow their businesses organically. Refine their messenger engagement strategies to book in qualified sales calls. Become a master at selling their premium priced online coaching services over a sales call with their prospect. Finally, radically enhance their clients' results with our coaching and service delivery framework. We are so confident in our ability to help our clients build a massively profitable online fitness coaching business that we operate with a refund guarantee. Should you get to the end of the Info Productions coaching program and you've not reached the financial goal we established during your onboarding call, we will transfer you the entire program fee back. If you are keen to learn more about our service and book yourself in for a call with me and Billy, then take a look at the link in our bio. Let's get back to the podcast. Are you mm-hmm. going out to eat? Are you socializing? What are you doing in that time? Yeah, exactly. Like a very social person. So a lot of time I spend with my girlfriend, like relationship is a big value of mine. Like my girlfriend, that's why she's working for me. I will travel for her as well. Uh, gym is a big one. Boxing was a big one. Reading was a big one. I read uh, over, it sounds like a brag. I love reading. I've read, I've read over 400 books in the last, I don't know, six, seven years. You know, so reading is a big one. Like, yeah, basically also personal development, but in just in, all, in other areas, you know, in other areas. Um, no, that's super interesting. Just like, just like developing some nice skills and becoming an all-rounded person. 
But I think as soon as I become older now already, I, I think naturally I will push the business to 30, 40, 50K. But I mean, you can also see it in the, in the role models I have. Like my friend really likes uh, Elon Musk. Uh, what's the guy? The guy from PayPal, Peter Thiel, all these guys. I, 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 these are cool. You know, uh, Dyson is a big, uh, what's the name? Dyson. Um, yeah. yeah. Guy, which one? I, I don't know his first name, but it's a huge company. Yeah. They also like, he's a big, big fan. I like these guys. But uh, yeah, for me, like it doesn't excite me that much. I have other values. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. But it's cool. I mean, know thyself, right? Like, if you have a life, I'm not lifestyle business. I'm not like uh, apologetic about it. it. Is what it is. No, right? no. There's no need to be. Each, it's, just, it's super interesting. It's different different perspective to other individuals. Each well, own, I, yeah. different perspectives to my my take on things, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So, what what made you choose to build the business with your girlfriend or partner with your girlfriend? That's a super good question. Um, I would say I want to travel the world, first of all, because I want to be free. Second of all, funny story, I want to have like uh, zero taxes. So I will register my business uh, to Panama, which is 100% legal. But because of this, I cannot stay longer than six months in the same country. Mm -hmm. You know, so I need to travel around for a couple of years. So this was my base freedom and like zero taxes, which, which is tied to tie it into the, to the freedom value. So I'd say relationship and connection is my second value. And I'm not a big fan of, I know a lot of online entrepreneurs does it. Like they, they go into a country, they don't know Tinder and they just like have casual things with, with women the whole, the whole the day through, whole weeks through. But for me, it was never like very fulfilling, you know, like to build something with women and to have like meaning in the whole thing. And you know, that's what I really care about. And also later family. So um, and she wants, and she's not able to have an online business herself. So I was like, yeah, you can work for me. It's a win-win. I can give you income. You can work two hours a day for me travel the world with me, go to nice places. It was an easy sell. So mm. I think it just, it just makes sense overall. And I can provide her with a good experience, build something together and also like provide for her. You know, I think especially as men, I mean, for me, especially also for you, it's, it's cool to be able to provide for your girl, you know, to make money, not just for you, but also for your girlfriend. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. also a cool experience. Has there been any difficulty with that with regards to the relationship then impeding business or vice versa? Not yet. Not yet. But to be honest, like she's like, uh, she's like, uh, apprentice in my i don't pay her yet so i will pay her from from september on okay or, or, or next next month maybe september but so far like she's uh because you know she's not she's not that mo money motivated neither i don't know how it is for your girl but it's kind of interesting um in eastern europe the women are very feminine and uh, i never heard a very feminine woman talk about her net worth goals that's funny inside like i never heard a, go a girl say oh, my, my net worth goal is like 100k and 1 million something like this mm. you know so i think she's not really motivated by money she's more motivated by my approval by you know my respect so she probably also does it to like appeal to me somehow sure. you know? so, so it's she doesn't want to be like like she doesn't want like 50 percent shares she just wants to have a little freelance job with me and you know have fun and that's it you know mm. so no issues with that and what's the relationship like with money? So, of course, you've been generating significant amounts of your business now, particularly as opposed to other career paths. Mm -hmm. how, how are you choosing to spend your money? And do you feel like you've been spending it wisely or do you feel like there's somewhat of that aspect you can improve? 100% improved because I'm an ENFP personality type like Myers-Briggs, right? So uh, that's why my girlfriend now is also ISFJ. For people that don't know Myers-Briggs, she's very like grounded. She looks at the details. She, she likes to check what she spends. And I'm overspending a lot. So uh, I have uh, not the best relationship with money. I mean, not the best. I have a, almost like too much of an abundance mindset. I'm like, I'm like, uh, yeah, if I spend a bit too much, like it, it will come back next month. So, and somehow, somehow I always makes it, make it happen. You know, the moment I invested in your coaching, the biggest amount I ever invested, the same month I made like the biggest amount I ever made, yeah. you know, but I mean, of course, in the future, I need to be careful. That's so why I will have like zero taxes so I can, I can save money there. So you're not particularly security driven from a financial perspective, or are you? Security driven, you mean? So for example, I know that my expenses on a monthly basis are probably around 3K yep. tops. And yep. I know that I won't spend any more than that because I'm very security driven. Like no matter how much money I'm, I'm generating in the business, I'd much rather operate very low living expenses. Um, and then no, I'm, I, I'm not that security driven then. No. Okay. I still try to save money for things, but I'm not that security driven. Then security is not my number one value. Okay, and that leads me to my next question. When did you buy your first Rolex? Already have one. No, when, when did you buy it? Ah, sorry, I thought when is it? <laughs> no, no, no. When, when did you buy it? I mean, it's a bad story, but it was uh, it was October, October 2021. It was a, it was a, like technically speaking, you can say it's it's a bad a bad investment, you know, from the business standpoint. But again, my friend Florian, he's, he he knows my motivation. She was like, uh, yeah, you should buy it for the mindset. I know you like watches, just get it. So it's one that I bought or used. 
you know, not too expensive. And also the moment I bought it also I made more revenue because it's kind of the, the, the mindset, you know, that I had. Mm. So, uh, but of course I could have invested better in, let's say, ads, mentoring, everything was, was of a bad investment. Um, like business speaking was a bad investment, but I made the money back and uh, it, it kind of opens doors as well. You know, like you recognize the Rolex and all yeah. the guys also do. So it opens, it opens doors like a subconscious thing, you know, it's like, oh, this guy is one of my, my in, on my team, you know. From so a social it, perspective, definitely. Yeah, yeah. it, it kind of opens. Though I also bought it for, for this reason to, to have the doors like open a little bit, you know, to go into these mm. circles. You know, it's like buying a Ferrari. Probably if you buy a Ferrari, you are in the, in the circle of these guys. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I just yeah. find it interesting with regards to different perspectives on the financial aspect. So I'm very security driven, but I've thought mm. I bought two pieces, but I've sold them both. So you bought one? I sold them both. I bought two pieces, two Rolexes, and sold uh, them both. So the one submarine and which one? Uh, so Mariner with uh, so Mariner dates and then a date just blue doll. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Jubilee. But yeah, I mean, no, I, I sold them both. <coughs> so I saw no, honestly, no benefit to it. And I, I mean, found this, all, yeah, sorry. I found it. I found myself experiencing somewhat self-inflated ego, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, to to be honest, every guy watching here, don't do the thing that I did. You know, it's <laughs> it's not the smartest thing to do. But for me, it's kind of cool to look at it because uh, when I started my business, I was 11,000, not 11, probably like $11,000 in debt. And now I have a watch that is almost worth that much. So for mm. me, it's a little bit of a reminder. I look at my wrist. I'm like, okay, dude, come on. Like, can, uh, it's, a good, it's a sign for me that I made it for me personally. And then also you can always buy it. I think it even went up 1K. The price went up 1K. So I can always like buy it and that's it. You know, we'll find someone. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's like a, rem a reminder, but I try not to like, I mean, I, I told no one that I have a Rolex. If people ask, I, I show them, I tell them, but uh, I don't really, I don't like to like tell people. It's, I, on the Instagram, I think I don't even really showing it just on the reels. It's just like, you know, don't yeah, like sure. to like, brag if it, but it's, it's How old are you, man? Of How old are you now? I look very young, but I will be 29 in the two months. 29. So what's your objective for the next five years or so, both with regards to business and also life moving forward? It's a very good question. Like also, again, my friend, he makes a lot of fun of my short term thinking, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not thinking that short term, but I think in five years, uh, most likely case I make 20, 20 grand a month on a consistent basis, maybe even already transition to like some dating coaching with women, maybe even make more there. Um, and maybe even like, I have also money invested in, in crypto or other investments and it's it's hard to tell. Probably net worth. I would I would hope one, one million net worth to have a little bit of security long term. Maybe living in a country where I don't need to pay taxes. This is one thing for me. Maybe Malta, Cyprus, something like this. But I will I will continue to do coaching, hundred percent. Mm. One thing though I would love to do is I enjoy podcasting. Like one of my we talked about role models before. I really like guys like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, you know, guys that are very well rounded. That's how I'm also into martial arts. Mm. And and other other skills. So a podcast would be quite nice. I'll talk more about talk more about personal development because after the experience with the, the loss of my mother, I, I dealt with it that well that I'm like maybe I should go more into this into this area of personal development. Like, but some some form of coaching. Yeah, no, interesting man, definitely some very interesting. And I suppose final question for me. I'm just I'm curious, and it won't necessarily go in the podcast because <laughs> I wanted to see necessarily. What what made you invest in our product? It's a good question. Um. I know that I'm the type of guy, again, ENFP personality type, I need accountability. And secondly, I wasn't confident enough to do it on my own. Even after two years with almost Mario, I was like, ah, let's, in my mind, I was like, maybe there's one thing I'm missing. And I knew for a fact you're better than me in business, you know? So I was like, let's just, you know, enroll in the, in the coaching. And if I just take one thing out of there, I already like sa saved a lot of money. Mm. I think it's that aspect. Yeah. I, I love to have mentors. It's like a uh, time travel almost. Yeah. I, I just want to see you push further with more aggression. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, I would, I would make progress for sure. I just, because the limiting belief I have is I ah, yeah, to go to 100K, it's more stressful. But uh, I think it's just a limiting belief. So I think as soon as I um, overcome this limit to leave, I could t clearly see myself doing one grand, 100 grand a month. I think you have to apply logic to that. I mean, on a, from a transactional basis, yes. And there's more numbers involved with regards to both the employee aspect of things and also the customers you're servicing. But mm -hmm. other than that, there's very similar levels of stress, in my opinion. The current levels you're operating at same levels sir yeah i thought the same similar not the same but similar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely yeah. so you have to operate as more of an operator arguably have more yeah. systems and processes in place and therefore yeah everything's documented and you know exactly what to do in terms of the operational aspects yeah so if, if the stress is the same probably go there for sure yeah let's yeah. see any any pro i think like progress is like my third or fourth value for sure 100 percent 
but yeah, it's it's, it's freedom first one, obviously. Freedom, yeah. relationship progress, all that good stuff. Yeah, definitely. Man. Awesome, awesome. But I'm surprised about your. Uh, so interrupt. I'm I'm surprised by your backstory. I had no idea. Like it's, it's funny how some minds think alike. It's uh, very very interesting. Yeah, no, very similar. I think majority of people within our products are also people that I connect with are very similar. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Matt, you also attract is... these people. I can tell the way you speak. Probably ninety percent of people are like okay, this guy talk some stuff but then 10 percent probably like wow he speaks like my language you know yeah well, other That's people cool. would say that you're somewhat like asperger's autistic or narcissistic one or the other yeah so, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Quite, yeah yeah frequently All yeah good. and it's, it's not the case but yeah good. Good. yeah man we'll, we'll wrap up there but that was that was awesome thank you of course it's a pleasure to be here man